Do you want me to introduce you? So we have probably everybody? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Great. All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Dr. Angela Carbonides. I am a naturopathic physician. And today I want to talk to you guys about a naturopathic approach to arthritis. So, first, um, for those that don't know, what's naturopathic medicine? It's a primary healthcare system that encourages the body's self healing process through natural therapies, drawing on both traditional healing methods and modern medical science. So as a naturopathic doctor, I am educated and trained in, in accredited naturopathic medical schools. We pass board exams, state licensing exams, participate in residencies, science-based practitioners, utilizing natural ways to optimize health. So really what we're doing is we're emphasizing disease prevention identifying underlying cause of dysfunction, and developing personalized plans to restore and establish optimal health, and really working on supporting the body's inherent healing process. There are certainly, certainly naturopathic doctors that have specialized in certain conditions, but really we are helping everybody in, in, in every everything. So in my practice, I see Pediatrics, to geriatrics, for acute conditions, chronic conditions, autoimmune disease, thyroid, gastrointestinal issues, just really across the board. Depending on state licensing, some naturopathic physicians are primary care physicians in the state. In the state of Ohio, we're not. Um, so really, what does that mean? You keep your primary care physician, and then people utilize us as specialty. We can order labs, and there are specialty labs, and so really working um, in conjunction with your other team of doctors. The recommendations um, that you would get when you come see me are diet, lifestyle, we'll do botanical interventions, vitamins, minerals, and working on that mental emotional component. So the goal is always to address the underlying cause of dysfunction and decrease the load burden on the body for improved health outcomes. Because remember, the body has that inherent self-healing process, so it is our job to re decrease that load burden, and we're gonna talk about that a little bit today. So we know arthritis is degenerative, inflammatory, there can be an autoimmune component, and basically we have a breakdown of this articular cartilage right here. So this is nice and healthy, this is where it's starting to break down. In that breakdown, you can get alterations of the bone, and then pain signals, which can result from any of those factors above, but also from the fatigue of the muscles that are crossing that arthritic joint. So in front of you, you have a copy of our wellness wheel. And this is basically a visual depiction of my approach to health. That quote on the top says, virtually all human disease results from interactions of genetic susceptibility factors and modifiable environmental factors. These are infections, chemical, physical, nutritional, and behavioral. So we have the eight spokes on the wheel, and these are illustrating the cause of all dysfunction or imbalance in the body. These are the obstacles to cure. The, these are the areas that we're trying to decrease that load burden. Each of the spokes are connected and influence one another, and this is why we have those bi-directional arrows. So the outside, are gonna be more physical type of symptoms and the inside more mental emotional. Nothing in the body works in isolation, so this is where naturopathic medicine is unique because we're really looking at all of these factors. If you come in to see me and say, 
I'm here because I have arthritis and I'm in a lot of pain. I'm not only going to be working on that, I'm going to be working on all the other things because those are important in our overall health and improving the symptoms that are affecting our daily quality of life. So again, worth to reiterate, our body has an innate intelligence and basically we get in the way of it. So it's intelligent, resilient, adaptive, and has an inborn wisdom that's always striving for balance. So it's up to us to decrease that load burden. So our body can do what it's meant to do. The first spoke on the wheel is genetics. So as the saying goes, genes load the gun and environment pulls the trigger. Genetic variations don't cause disease, but they influence our susceptibility to environmental factors. Our daily choices every minute of the day, the choices that we're making can impact our genes in a favorable way by turning good genes on and bad genes off. Every moment of every day our genes are communicating, giving instructions that influence energy, mood, metabolism, weight, and other health outcomes. Everything on this wellness wheel is going to affect genetic expression. This is an illustration from um, one article just showing all of the factors that are affecting our genetic expression. So you'll see nutritional, exercise, pollutants such as smoke, alcohol, uh, stress. I think a lot of times don't think, people don't think about stress affecting many areas of our health, but they really do. And Oftentimes, when I see somebody with autoimmune disease, I will talk about we'll talk about when it first started and what was going on in their life at that time. And, and nine times out of ten, it was a major stressful uh, situation that altered our body's immune response. So we have the ability to impact our genes on our genetic expression and potential through our daily life choices. The second spoke on the wheel is nutrition. So here we think about organic, whole foods, and processed foods. Has anybody ever heard of uh, EWG.org, Environmental Working Group? So this is a really good source to start kind of teasing out areas in your life where you can decrease toxic burden. Every year they publish uh, Clean 15 and the Dirty Dozen. We'll talk a little bit more about how herbicides and pesticides can affect our health. But the Clean 15 and Dirty Dozen will tell you those 15 fruits and vegetables that you can absolutely buy not organic. Either they're not as heavily sprayed or because of the, um, the outside of that vegetable, it's not kind of uh, penetrating into the fruit or veggie, so you're not consuming those herbicides and pesticides. And the 15, the Dirty Dozen, will they they always add a few more, but the dirty dozen are those foods that we really have to try to buy organic. And when you start really delving into it, you'll see the more organic you can buy across the board, the better, because really everything is um, heavily treated with chemicals that are deleterious to our health. Nutrient deficiencies and excesses, food allergies or food sensitivities. So a lot of what I do is really personalizing nutrition based on our bioindividuality, and that's our blood type. So based on our blood type, there's gonna be foods that are gonna be more inflammatory than others, even though they're whole foods. Our gut bacteria eat for our, our blood type. So the more super foods that we can eat that affect our gut microbiome, the, the better outcomes we're gonna have on mood, gastrointestinal health, cognition, pain, immune health, even obesity. Um, diet can really help to improve symptoms. In my first visit, if people are open to it, while we're ordering labs, while we're doing some other things, I always do diet and lifestyle changes. And the majority of the time, people come back after three to four weeks with drastic improvements in skin stuff, GI stuff, pain, all kinds of different symptoms that you wouldn't necessarily expect. And this is the power of you know, utilizing food as medicine, and I love that. 
Um, sometimes there isn't an improvement, right? And that's also giving us sign and symptom of other underlying causes. So nutrient deficiencies and excess, this could be from diet. Maybe we're just not consuming enough of the foods that we need. But also our soil nutrient content is a fraction of what it was decades ago. Genetics play a role on our nutritional status. So folate um, is our natural form of B9. This is essential vitamin. It needs to be activated like all the B vitamins in order to function in our body. But this is done through genes. For folate, it's done through the MTHFR gene. Mutations in these genes affect over 75% of the population. So you could have reduced enzyme activity up to 75%. So essentially, you're operating out of a deficiency state just because of this genetic um, influence. Folic acid is the artificial form. This is largely found in a lot of over-the-counter supplements and in food. It's not natural, but it still attaches to those folate receptors. And then by doing that, it keeps or blocks natural folate from getting into the cells where we want it to be. Without enough methylated folate, you can't methylate. Gene function and health outcomes will be compromised. So methylation, we need this to burn more fat, to keep our cells healthy, uh, probably you've heard about folate during pregnancy. If we're not getting enough of this, the baby can have neural, neural tube defects or congenital heart defects. It's important in brain and muscle health, balancing mood, our stress response, detox, immune, heart health, DNA repair, and sleep. Vitamin D can also be affected by genetics. There's associations with low bone mineral density, osteoporosis, osteoarthritis, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, infertility, and cancer risk with low vitamin D levels. We either make this in the body from sunlight that we're exposed to or through foods in our diet. But remember, 20 minutes of arm and face exposure is only gonna give you about 200 international units of vitamin D. Usually people need somewhere around 5,000 international units a day. You don't know unless you get tested and see where your levels are at. Maybe you need more, maybe you need less. But this is one lab um, that's very important to test. And anymore, just because insurance has gotten so tricky, it is not often tested in those yearly labs, but it should be requested and it should be tested. There is a study um, showing that in 556 participants, low intake or low serum vitamin D levels were associated with an increased risk of progression of osteoarthritis of the knee. Those low serum vitamin D levels are also predicting loss of cartilage as assessed by loss of joint space and osteophyte growth. We need vitamin A in order for those vitamin D receptors to work. How are we getting our vitamin A? If we're getting it in those colorful fruits and veggies, it's we're getting it in the inactive form and our body has to convert this to the active form in order to be able to use in the body. The active form is gonna be from animal sources. Only one third of beta carotene is absorbed, um, period. And then it has to be converted to retinol in the intestines in order to meet those vitamin A requirements. So if you have some variants in this BCO1 gene, again, you can be oper operating from a deficient state because you're not getting optimal conversion. Also in a lot of food-based supplements, which I like, but depends on genetics, right? That this is the right kind of multi for you. So if you see, it says vitamin A is in the form of beta carotene. Um, other than B12, which is listed as methylcobalamin, the activated form, our B vitamins are in the inactivated form. So you have to rely on your body to convert this in order to be able to use what you are supplementing with. Vitamin A is important, important in collagen, um, cell growth, development, immune function, 
uh, growth and development of bone vision, right? And this says um, right here, it's talking about vitamin A and its ability to help stimulate collagen. So we think about some other essential and non-essential nutrients that are important in the health of our joint, right? So here's that articular cartilage. It's important to keep this nice and plump so it, it withstands that the, the load that we're putting on it. It's made of collagen and proteoglycans, we'll talk about those in some other slides, and chondrocytes are basically the cells that are supporting this, the synthesis of everything in that articular cartilage. The composition, the wet weight is water, 65 to 85% water. So this is where you see how hydration is really important. Um, the rest are proteoglycans and then the dry weight is collagen. In addition to that, joint motion and load are so important in maintaining that structure of um, the cartilage because if you're inactive, the cartilage starts to break down. So it's kind of a catch-22 because if you have arthritis, if you're in a lot of pain, you may not want to exercise or work out, okay? So it's just trying to find that balance. Um, collagen synthesis. So we need amino acids. So these are proteins. Um, we're going to get the amino acids from the proteins that we eat. Hydroxyproline, proline, lysine, vitamin C. This is an essential nutrient needed for collagen synthesis. We have to get this supplementally. Our body cannot make this on, on its own. Iron, vitamin E, A, B6, zinc, boron. So many times people come in and they've just like handpicked a couple of vitamins and minerals to take, but all of them are important. And depending on what you're taking, you also have to be careful because if you're consuming some vitamins or minerals and, and you're not balancing it with the others, you can cause a deficient state. So for example, in these past couple years, people have really been loading up on zinc, which is not a bad thing. I mean, you can load up on it when you need it. But if you're doing that for a long period of time and you're not taking a little copper, you're gonna cause a copper deficiency. Same thing with calcium and magnesium. These are balancing each other out in the body. You can't just take one and forget about the other. So again, cartilage. Um, the glycosaminoglycans and proteoglycans. So basically, here's the collagen in your cartilage, and off of there we have these uh, proteins. So we have hyaluronic acid, and then over here are the proteoglycans and the glycosaminoglycans. So the glycosaminoglycans are these side chains of keratin sulfate, chondroitin sulfate. Maybe you've heard of some of these nutrients in uh, joint formulas. But these glycosaminoglycans, and proteoglycans, these things right here, those are what's providing the cartilage, the osmotic properties, um, which are critical in resisting compressive loads. This is like keeping all that water in there and keeping it nice and supple. Glucosamine is important in joint health. So this is made naturally in the body from glucose. It's a structural component, a component of cartilage, and it's used in making these proteoglycans and the glycosaminoglycans. It's a precursor for chondroitin sulfate and hyaluronic acid. So we have glucose, enzymatic function, glucosamine, enzyme activity, hyaluronic acid, chondroitin sulfate. Um, we might lose ability to stimulate um, the manufacture of glycosaminoglycans um, as we age, and this is because of a um, reduced capacity to manufacture glucosamine. So, um, you know, this is where supplementation can be helpful. Glucosamine has a small molecular size, so when you are incorporating that perhaps through supplementation, if that might be right for you, um, your body can really absorb this and utilize it to stimulate the synthesis of these glycosaminoglycans. So these are some pretty cool studies. Um, basically, it was studying glucosamine over placebo, 
and improving pain symptoms of arthritis, and it did. One of them compared glucosamine sulfate to NSAIDs, our non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. And there was better outcomes with glucosamine than NSAIDs, right? How does this happen? Because glucosamine is not affecting inflammatory pathways or those pain relieving pathways, but what it is doing is it's actually improving the health of the joint and that's why we're not experiencing as much pain. So again, keratin sulfate, chondroitin sulfate, what do we need? We need our amino acids. We have acids. We have to have good protein at every meal in order to um, get glutamine, serine, threonine, aspergine. And again, you see these vitamin minerals popping up that are important in manufacturing these. So um, some formulas will have chondroitin sulfate in it. This molecule is huge, and it's really too large to pass through a healthy and intact intestinal barrier. So likely any clinical benefit is just because your body is breaking it down and then using the breakdown products to again incorporate into those glycosaminoglycans versus using that whole unit, that whole molecule. So these are, chondrocytes are the cells that are helping keep this cartilage healthy. And they can be affected by inflammation and inflammatory markers, right? It reduces its capacity to make those molecules that are necessary in keeping cartilage healthy. So what can we do to modulate this inflammation in our body? Well, lots of things, but one of them is making sure we're getting enough omega-3 fatty acids. Omega-3 fatty acids, these are essential. We have to get these through our diet. Our body cannot manufacture these on our own. They are anti-inflammatory. Flaxseed, flaxseed oil is very high in omega-3s. Omega-6 oils are our sunflower, corn, peanut oil. These are very pro-inflammatory. They um, have an effect on a molecule called arachidonic acid. This is also involved in a lot of like mast cell stuff, which is kind of um, allergic stuff. So especially if you have pain, if you have allergies, allergic type symptoms, you really have to work on balancing this omega-3 fatty acid versus omega-6 uh, fatty acid. Honestly, we didn't even have sunflower, corn, or peanut oil in my house. Like I would just have olive oil and flaxseed oil. It was super beneficial. So, um, you know, as it relates to omega-3s, well, what about what we're eating? Um, so, again, paying attention to what we're buying, where we're getting um, our foods. Animals are also affected by what they eat. Fish are high in omega-3s because of the plankton that they eat. In general, greens are high in omega-3s because of the chloroplasts and the green plants are high in omega-3s. So think about grasses, weeds, green leafy vegetables. This is why it matters if cows are being allowed to graze on grass or if they're being fed corn. If they're being fed corn, you're consuming that protein and it's gonna be so much higher in omega-6 fatty acids versus omega-3. All right, so exercise is another component of the wheel. It is anti-everything. And it's really important we're finding the right type of individualized exercise. So this is where it's helping with circulation. When you're helping with circulation, you're getting hydration and diffusion of nutrients in the joint. Muscle strength helps to reduce the load burden on the joints as well. And we talked about that balance, right? Because it's like, oh, it's so much pain. It's really hard to move. So I can improve these um, the arthritis outcomes. Well, you know what? There was a study in just six minutes a day of movement, along with some nutritional modifications, helped with arthritic symptoms. So again, um, you know, exercise, certainly this isn't the whole story, right? But obesity and chronic health conditions 
Um, obesity is the leading cause of arthritic pain, injuries, muscle, and joint atrophy, especially in the knee, ankle, foot, and shoulder. There are methylation changes, right? Those changes that we want to make in our genes for better outcomes, silencing those bad genes, quote unquote. Um, there's methylation changes that happen in just one exercise session. Regular exercise also reduces, reduces inflammatory markers. It decreases our hunger hormone, ghrelin, increases satiety hormone, leptin. Many of the genes that are altered during exercise include those that play a role in energy metabolism, insulin response, and inflammation. You know, just fat cells alone secrete their own inflammatory markers. So this inflammation um, is contributing to a multitude of conditions, um, including arthritis. So here's another place where you can really think about um, our bioindividuality and our blood type. So do you guys know your blood type here? So who's A? A, A, are you guys O? You don't know, are you O? Most people are A and O. So for O, um, for O's just because of certain genes, more intense exercise is usually needed um, to kind of release those stress hormones, and it's gonna be really important. For blood type A, you can think of blood type A and kind of a type A personality. Yes, having that higher intensity is important. You're thinking of somebody you know, or you're thinking of somebody you know. Um, but also calming, right? Because, because type A seems to be that like type A personality, that calming exercise is really important to reduce stress and inflammation. Also, type O and type A, unless, which are the most common, unless you're type B, if you want to reduce inflammation and improve uh, microbiome, metabolism, etc., you should not be considering whey protein. Whey protein is really only beneficial for B. Um, dairy is very inflammatory for type O's and A's, and there are some caveats, but, but milk in general is a no-go, and I see this all the time. So sleep. This is our time to rest and repair. If we are not resting, if we're not getting good quality sleep, we're not repairing, and every um, aspect of our health is going to be compromised. So we think about following kind of our natural circadian rhythm, um, avoiding electronics before bed, turning off artificial lights. If you do have trouble getting to sleep, um, one little trick that can be helpful is just swap out your um, bulb by your nightstand and put a red light in there. It increases melatonin and can help kind of change those brain waves to get us to sleep a little bit easier. Stress, this is huge. Our body does not differentiate between mental, emotional stress and physical stress. So it's that, you know, it's that analogy of our body doesn't know if we are so stressed because somebody cut us off at the red lights or if we're running from a bear trying to save our life. Does not know the difference. Stress can be emotional, physical, biochemical. So we think about other conditions of the body. Uh, diabetes and insulin insensitivity, for example. Insulin is actually needed to stimulate chondrocytes, those cells, those specialized cells in our cartilage. And it helps them stimulate the increased synthesis and assembly of those proteoglycans that we talked about. So insulin deficiency or an insensitivity or our body's ability to respond to the insulin that's getting put out is going to predispose us to osteoarthritis. Also, um, making sure the thyroid is working correctly. You know, you think about thyroid and just everything that has to do with metabolism. So hypothyroid is also correlated with increased risk of osteoarthritis and, of course, attitude. 
So mindfulness techniques are shown to boost antibodies, reduce stress and inflammation, and improve quality of life. I mean, our body's inherent intelligence is rewarding us for just being positive, which is amazing. Unresolved emotional and physical trauma. Um, we can actually store trauma into our body. They can cause fascial adhesions, and that can interfere with the healing process. Toxins are huge. We can get um, toxin exposure from our environment, alcohol, tobacco, food, water, cosmetics, medications, microbes, emotions. Um, again, ewg.org is a really great resource. Plastic water bottles, the, the chemicals that these are made, made out of. Um, sunscreen, our detergents, cleaning products, pans, clothing. These all have chemicals in them, and some are worse than others. Just storing your cleaning products under your sink with the cat clothes isn't going to keep from those volatile organic compounds from getting out and, and you inhaling them. So we inhale over 500 environmental chemicals every day. The average person today carries at least 700 contaminants in his body. Even newborn umbilical cord is found to contain over 200 contaminants. I mean, it's pretty scary. Do you dry clean? That increases your measure, uh, levels of trichloroethylene in your blood. So this is why it's really important to reduce that body burden as much as you can. It only takes 26 seconds for chemicals to enter your bloodstream. The chemicals inside are a lot higher than outside, if you think about because that air exchange is providing dilution. So even at home, like now is the perfect time of the year to keep your windows open as much as possible. As long as you don't have allergies to what's out there, that can be, that can be problematic. So um, again, so we talked about that environmental working group thinking about Dirty Dozen, Clean 15. Well, here's a reason why it matters. So there was a study done, the red here, um, shows overlap between the areas where there is, um, so the uh, herbicide atrazine is as heavily used in this area. People in this area that have this chronic exposure to atrazine have decreased metabolic rate uh, increased body weight, intra-abdominal fat, insulin resistance, mitochondrial dysfunction. Oh, I have five minutes left? Okay. I think we're almost done. Um, and symptoms are wor worse with high-fat diets. Okay, so we have atrazine in our drinking water. I think there's actually a source on EWG that will take you to, um, you can put in your city estate, and they'll tell you what's been found in your water, but this is where good filtration system really matters, and unfortunately, the kind that come like in your fridge are not great. So again, looking at labels, um, you know, be careful because there's so much green marketing now. You know, non-GMO is not organic. You know, we need to be careful and really read these things. So medications, these can actually be toxic. And we think about cost benefit for everything, right? But acid blockers, these are causing nutrient deficiencies in magnesium, calcium, B12. Um, NSAIDs, right? If you're on these for a long period of time, it's affecting your gastric function. It's also shown to inhibit collagen matrix and synthesis and accelerate cartilage production, destruction. So, I mean, if you're on these symptoms for your arthritic pain, it's actually just uh, contributing to the problem if you're using it long term. The other thing, glucocorticoids. So maybe you're on something like this, like prednisone, if you have to modulate inflammation, modulate immune response. People can be taking these for irritable bowel or asthma, rheum rheumatoid arthritis. If you're on this medication, short term, long term, it is increasing your risk of fracture. Fractures occur in 50% of patients who take this medication long term. Even a small dose at 2.5 uh, milligrams per day is increasing fracture risk up to 200% compared to patients that are not taking them. 
these drugs decrease our bone building activity and increase bone breakdown. They also alter the way calcium is processed and reduce collagen production. We, you know, we don't want to be on these long term. It's fine if you need it, but long term we want to find other solutions. Because what are they doing, right? They're affecting our immune system. 70% is located in the guts. Allergies, autoimmunity, cancer, chronic infections, chronic inflammation, this is all affecting our immune health. That is the last spoke on the wheel. Does anybody have any questions? <coughs> you, talked, you talked a lot about osteoarthritis. How does all of this relate to food? Same stuff. Same stuff. Because you're still having that joint compromised. The joint health is being compromised. So if I an inflammatory process, that inflammatory process is going to be autoimmune. Autoimmune, everything on that wellness wheel. Same thing. I'll add to what she's saying is that's one of the reasons why when we created this program, we didn't distinguish between the types of arthritis because it is connected to autoimmune. There are different reasons and it's not one size fits all. So having more tools in your tool basket to understand that no matter what type of arthritis you have, there's still very common symptoms and similarities that are happening between them. So as wonderful as I think it is that there are specialists who focus on RA, osteoarthritis, all the different types. Sometimes you can get away from the fact that there's still underlying symptoms that still all relate to each other. And when we can focus on those symptoms and those tools to help alleviate those symptoms, it doesn't matter what kind you have, they, you can still find relief. And also, I'll add for autoimmune, um, this is where naturopathic medicine really shines because in uh, your, you know, Western model, there's really nothing that addresses autoimmune dysfunction. But we test these antibodies and we see them decrease over time by all of these factors. And um, there's also herbal formulations and botanicals that really help modulate this immune response. And those antibodies decrease. I mean, we see it all the time. This is why antibodies are not often tested in uh, like, you know, through primary care and endocrinology because, you know, there's nothing to target them. And so a lot of times, you know, I mean, I guess you wouldn't know if they're fluctuating or not, but we test it because we see these change. And that's a way that, um, you know, one way we can assess efficacy of what we're doing in addition to, you know, symptoms. Angela will be back with us on Wednesday at 9.32. So but it'll be a different group then? Potentially a different yeah. group, or it could be the same people for the second half of what you're talking about. So if you guys think of questions. Oh, am I supposed to have two know? presentations? Whatever you want. Oh, I did not. Okay, so I thought I was doing the so same presentation two days. Monday, Tuesday classes are the same class, different people. Wednesday, Thursday, or in the uh, But the good thing is here, then, or it could be the same people, sorry, I didn't mean different people. It could be the same people then on Wednesday or Thursday. Um, it could be the same class? Well, well I, yeah, obviously, because I messed up. I didn't realize no, there was right. two different so presentations. So what I was going to say is if you want to, after hearing this, if you plan on coming on Wednesday, come with some questions, come with yeah. some different thoughts, from what she talked about too, because it takes some time to digest. And I'm just sharing from my own yeah. personal experience. Angela is one of my Pilates of her former clients. So I'll pick her brain a lot without trying to make her work. <laughs> Sometimes because she's coming to do something for herself, so I don't want to make her work. But there have been a lot of nuances that just little pieces that she doesn't even know that she has mentioned or talked about before that have got me thinking. And so I'll email her or I'll ask her the next time I see her because I needed to be able to look at my world and figure out how that either fits or where I'm doing it so that I can get more in information. 
beyond that. Um, I, if you guys want to send Eliz uh, Elizabeth, Alexis um, questions, if you have follow-up questions or things you want to talk about Wednesday, do you can do that. Send them to me today. Um, I'm not going to have a fancy PowerPoint. But what I could do is, so we, so we can answer those questions. But also, I mean, I, there, I do have other, like if you guys, um, I, haven't, I haven't done this talk in a while, but I guess if I revisit it, I'll see how good it was. Um, but I do have one on stress. Like everybody is super stressed. We know that affects our, our immune system. Uh, we know that affects like pain, inflammation, and it's altering all those things on the wellness wheel. So I, you know, I could do that. Like if you guys just send me something, if I have something prepared, I'll do it. Otherwise, I'll just answer questions. Or if you need to notice something on the wellness wheel that you find, like I'd really like to get more in depth on this. Yeah. You guys can email. I just sent you guys an email just the other day, so you can even reply back to that email and let me know, and then I'll get that to you. Yeah. Look at the wheels and what. You can even give it like a rating of your your pet, how you feel you do mm -hmm. each drop of the wheel. And then think about things that you might want to improve in that section. Uh, uh, get the brain flowing. Because personally I've had some of her clients come to Pilates and they just shared like oh, she did my blood type and so we've been doing this and I've heard different things. Oh yeah, we had um, some people that when I did the nutritional detox. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, I've never personally, after I've heard those people talk, I'm like I really should, I mean I know my blood type, but I'm like I really need to go see her in her office and like well, find here's... out more about it. And it can make, even seeing your, I learned something, even yeah, seeing yes. your presentation, I, see why I love Pilates, yoga, and those different things that are more calming on my body, my body enjoys, because my body responds to them better. And I tell everyone, if you've ever tried Pilates with me before, I explain it as it's not like a secret magic pill because nothing happens fast and overnight. But when I started training in it and teaching it, I was in it for a year. I was only teaching it uh, three days a week, but I was taking it Two days a week. So I was physically doing Pilates two days a week. And nothing else changed in my life behavior. Everything else was the same. And I just started adjusting my portions because I was dating someone at the time who ate like a five year old. So he wanted chicken and JoJo's and pizza all the time. So instead of eating three pieces of pizza, I was eating one and I was ordering a salad. So all I adjusted was my mindset on what I was eating and what I what else I was intaking. And in that year, I lost 50 pounds. I had no idea I'd lost 50 pounds. I didn't because it was slow, but what I felt was my body felt good. I felt stronger, I felt more confident, I felt good. And it makes sense that my, I'm A positive, and so my body responds really well to that lengthening, that stretching, that decompression that happens in that type of practice. So that's why it makes, yeah, that makes tons of sense. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And when I post um, her talks to on YouTube, I have her website and then I took notes as well. So I'll kind of post those under the notes and I can email those to you guys as well. I'd like to learn more about eating for your blood type. I know 